I can go. Let me just uh, put this in real quick. So this is just a case I reviewed a little bit ago that um, it's an older case, but we've had a showed a similar one. I mean, again, there's nothing here that would you could see all these very small nodules. Um, you know, hard to tell the distribution. I mean, predominantly central ovular, but I mean, it, with this many, I mean, you could always say it's it's random. It's really hard to tell. I don't see clear studying. I mean, a lot of sparing of the subplural, so predominantly central ovular. Anyways, uh, this guy was immunocompromised, and he he had an aspiration pneumonia. But on top of that, this was a uh, strongyloides infection. So. Another one of those, I guess, disseminated strongyloid infections, the one where you get more kind of because they lodge in the pulmonary arterials. Um, anyways, I, I don't love cases where I can't make the diagnosis without really any history, but this this was another case of strongyloid. I presume he had it in his intestine. Yes, okay. he had it everywhere. He was. He also had syphilis. He had like a bunch. Of, he was okay. Like a seven year old seven year old guy, yeah. Okay. He had a bunch of things going on. Um this let me go to this case. I thought this was really interesting. So this was a incidentally discovered kind of vascular or at least enhancing mediastinal mass here in the anterior mediastinum on a neck CT. So they got Oh, where's the, oh, you gotta be kidding me. How did that not get over here? Uh, shoot. Somehow the contrast enhanced chest CT is missing, but the contrast enhanced chest CT would show what the neck CT kind of hinted at, that this was a very avidly arterial enhanced, oh, I'm very upset that this didn't come across, uh, very avidly enhancing arterially enhancing lesion. Uh, let me hold on one second. Let's see if I can get this. Well, if you want, we can come back around to you and you can, I mean, you can finish your other cases and then show this case. Yeah, so I'll come back when that, uh, I can do that by the time this is done, this will be over. So this, what was this case? Oh, so it's, it's, this is pretty funny. So uh, here is a older case, and this is kind of a nice chest X-ray showing this mass sitting here above the aorta. Harder to see on the lateral. I, I really struggled to see it on the lateral, uh, but it's it's this right here on the lateral foam. I don't think prospectively I could have made that uh, without the CT. And then the patient underwent a CT here. And this was the lesion. And I was showing my fellow, and he's like, oh, it's, you know, it's low density. It's going to be a bronchogenic cyst. And I'm like, oh, no, you know, a lot of the uh, neuroenteric tumors, I mean, the tumors of the peripheral nervous system, the schwannomas and neurofibromas, they can be low attenuation as well uh, on. CT, although this is quite low attenuation. Uh, but anyways, this, this was taken out and this was actually a bronchogenic cyst. So remember that even if you have a posterior mediastinal cyst, neuroenteric cysts are extraordinarily rare. I think I've seen two neuroenteric cysts, uh, often associated with vertebral body anomalies and other kind of you know, often like notochord syndrome, other weird things. Um, so this was actually, yeah, so most posterior mediastinal cysts actually turn out to be bronchogenic cysts, which this was, even though it's obviously not anywhere near the, uh, where we normally expect the bronchogenic cysts in the subcranial region. Hmm. 
Uh, yeah, I this, agree with your comment, Seth, about neuroenteric cysts being exceedingly rare. I've never seen one, and I've seen I've, a posterior mesial yeah. cysts that end up being bronchogenic as well. Yeah, no, they're called a lot of times they're called neuro, neuroenteric cysts, but um, invariably they're um, yeah, invariably they are uh, unless again really extremely rare to have a um, a true neuroenteric cyst. The ones I've seen, you know, people debilitated can't move because they have severe neural abnormalities in their spinal cord. Uh, this case, I mean, I, I don't think it's visible here. I mean, I'm curious if any of you guys would see anything. It's a, it's another mediastinal thing. I mean, to me, it's invisible. But you guys are probably Is there better. Is on top of the aortic arch? Here? Yeah. Yeah, that's probably part of it, but I'll show you the CT. Um, let me pull over the CT here. And I don't think I've seen this configuration of a double arch before. So this is a double arch where the left arch is the large dominant arch, and there's a very small right arch. Um, and I was trying to go back and I went through, I, I mean, I don't have, I maybe have about 10 double arch cases, but this is the first one that uh, I could remember seeing with this, or when I went back and looked, the first one I saw with this actual morphology. Have you guys seen a lot of double arches with this? <laughs> with the can say how rare they are. No, the, every one I've seen has been, and the literature supports the right dominant one. But yeah, yours is a yeah. left dominant one. That's that's so cool. I love that nip. That was that's cool. Yeah, no, it, it's it's really because I looked at this and I'm like, is this a double arch? I'm like, it has to be a double arch. But I'm like, but it looks so weird for even for a double arch. And yeah. I'm like, oh, it's a left dominant. And so, of course, you know, this woman is like 80 years old or 78 years old. And what do surgeons love to do? They love to operate. <laughs> so they operate on this woman to ligate her uh, her arch because she has some nonspecific symptoms. And she wound up with a, a chylothorax and a <laughs> non-resolving pneumothorax. So... You know, not funny, but just like, my Lord, literally the patient was 78. Right. Just, I mean, if it's a symptomatic yeah. ring, she would have had problems years ago. I know. I'm like, oh, my God. I can't believe they actually took this poor woman to surgery. Mm. The surgeons love to surgerize. Um, and the last case, wait, was that, the, was that all three cases? So, um, yeah. Well, anyways, I will come back to this last case, but I'll tell you from the next CT, you know, There's there was just a very hypervascular lesion here and uh, nothing else uh, and quite arterial enhancing and had to had persistent enhancement. This was actually a more, you can see a more venous phase, but we had an arterial phase. And so I gave, you know, the differential diagnosis, uh, par, you know, large parathyroid adenoma, uh, paraganglioma, um, ectopic thyroid tissue, a Castleman disease, and then I always kind of throw in hemangioma. Those are my five uh, hypervascular lesions in the anterior mediastinum. And uh, depending on what they look like, I mean, this doesn't have anything that would suggest it looks like thyroid. I mean, it, it doesn't have any low attenuation areas like we see kind of with ectopic goiters. And uh, I will show this real quick. I'll come back and I can show the arch if we have time. But they took this out, and this was actually hemangioma. So this was a uh, prevascular um, kind of hemangioma buried in some, yeah, in the anterior mediastinum. And it's only the second hemangioma, mediastinal hemangioma I've, I've come across. So relatively rare tumor. It's always at the bottom of that list. I've seen a lot more Castleman disease than I have hemangiomas. And when I say a lot more, I, that's like six versus two. Um, so uh, again, I, I, the surgeon called back, she's like, yeah, you didn't, you didn't even mention this one to me. I'm like, oh, look at my report. It's number five on the differential. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Did uh, on the non-con were there any little flebolus or anything? So, yeah, let me go in retrospect. Back. So the non-con was outside. And you know what? That's a good question. I, I mean, some punctate little things, but it could be noise too. Yeah, yeah maybe. Noise. Too small. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know most of the most of the flebolis I see more in the slow flow vascular malformations mm -hmm. than I do the hemangiomas per se, but there may be. I can actually, uh, when we get the path report, because they just took this out 
um, a couple of days ago and off of the uh, frozen, they said, oh, it's classic hemangioma. Um, but when I get the full path report, I'll have the surgeon pull uh, the path and see if there's any, I mean, yeah, I mean, you wonder, maybe there are. I'll see if they see I'm on pathology. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a, I'm trying to think if I've, I've seen slow flow of masculine malformations, but I don't think I've seen a hemangioma there. Yeah, it's only the second one I've seen. And the one, the, the, one I've seen and the two I've seen from the a, uh, our AIRP archives, both all the one I had, the other one and the other two, presented with recurrent hemothorax, and they couldn't figure out why. And it's known that these somehow, when they're especially more posterior, they can bleed and lead to uh, recurrent hemothorax. Not this one though. All right. Excellent. All right. I see David's joined us and Travis as well. So uh, anyone, uh, Howard, you weren't here last week. So would you like to go? Yeah. Sure. Hey, Jeff, can I go after him and show a couple? I'm going to have to get back to the reading room after Howard goes. Sure. Travis, go, go mm -hmm. first. I'll, I'll be on my phone in the reading room listening in the background. Uh, why don't you go then right now, Travis? Okay. So I was texting Seth about this earlier today. Actually, not this one, sorry, it's the other one that I'll show. But uh, two zebras today. This is a patient who first presented with, with shortness of breath in 2019 and has fibrosis. You can see there's a lot of, of bronchocentric distribution, bronchial wall thickening, some reticulation, some architectural distortion, almost some head cheese. Certainly, there's areas of lobular low attenuation. We don't have expiratory. I think everybody would agree this looks good for HP. They underwent a surgical lung biopsy, which confirmed that there were poorly formed non necrotizing granulomas consistent, or they thought most consistent with HP. And the question, the interesting thing about him is his history. Uh, this was an, an exposure I had not seen before, but certainly this part of the South, uh, this guy work, has worked for a long time in a cotton mill. And so exposed to a lot of cotton dust. Now, if you look in the literature, you'll see the term bisonosis more for like what is described as like acute on, or acute HP where patients develop symptoms on Mondays and then they improve on the weekends. And clearly this is fibrotic HP. And so I guess my question for you is, do you still, has anyone ever seen like fibrosis from bisonosis? Could there be some mold in the cotton you know, just also causing HP? But you know, I want to call this bisonosis with I never disease. understood that whole thing because, right, I mean, it's the same thing where if you're, I, I, I always thought bisonosis is like you're in an enclosed area, like a silo or some mill, and you get this massive inhalational injury. But if you're exposed to it long term, you would still think you would develop like this fibrotic HP yeah, stuff. Right, I, it's the low level antigen exposure right, exactly. over time, decades. right. Yeah, I, that's what I would because think. Like, yeah, I was I, I showed it to Paige McAdams. I was like, oh, this is you know, this guy's a cotton mill worker. I think this fits the bill for bisonosis. And he was like going in the literature and really there's not much in terms of fibrosis with, with cotton mill. It's all more of the acute disease, but that's what I'm calling it. If anybody wants to object, I mean it's it's HP. I mean it's an academic point, but it's fun to use a a, a new term. Is but is is it, true was what they called uh, it wasn't bisonosis called like brown lung or something? Uh, like an old term. I remember reading it like when I was a resident. Um, I thought it was more, it wasn't a hypersensitivity response because it, it's not just cotton, but it's like other plant fibers. And I thought it was like, I don't know, I don't, maybe it was. A, yeah. So, so like um, I, I have looked at a couple of things like bison is, it's Latin for, for like, for like linen or flax or all these different seeds. Oh, it is. You know, this one talked to, this one talked about a type of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, like the acute issues, right? But I don't know. So it's I funny they call so, it a type, but then in a couple senses down, they say the disorder shares some features with hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Right. So, yeah, I never but, understood this, this. I never understood the grain stuff. I, yeah. It still confuses me. Yeah. I mean, regardless, this is you know surgically proven you know, chronic HP, and he has you know, an organic antigen exposure. So I just thought it was an interesting, different history. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see if the pathologists at Duke have 
have uh, seen anything that ties this to cotton in terms of seeing some fibers in the lung or something like that. It seems to me that if you're inhaling fibers, a lot of th those could stick around. So it might be hypersensitivity to an agent where you can actually have macroscopic findings. Huh. Yeah, the, that's a good thought. Or microscopic findings for the, from the pathologist. And I know that when I was at Duke, you know, bisonosis was a topic. I didn't see that many cases, but there was a lot more um, cotton industry in, at Duke when I was there in the in the 80s. And um, and Phil Pratt, the pathologist then, who handed off things to Vic Rogley, um, had seen a fair amount of it. So you might ask Vic, yeah. Vic Rogley in pathology if there are any distinctive findings on lung path from bisonosis that help distinguish it from other hypersensitivity. He would yeah, be very I'll, I'll reach out to him. That's a good thought, right? Because otherwise maybe it's some mold or other right. you know, other thing that's yeah. more typical. You no, know, the other thing in the cotton industry is that they, you know, it's not just cotton that they're working with. They put all these finishing materials on the cotton before they, you know, they ship the fabric and stuff like that. And you know that's why you get these instructions sometimes when you get a new garment to wash it first to get the rid of the sizing and things like that. So they they coat those uh, you know those fibers with a whole bunch of stuff. So it's not just one exposure. Great, yeah. I'll, Vic is still around some. I will reach out and ask. I'll follow up with you guys. Yeah, email him. All right, this is the one that I reached out to Seth to see if he's had ever encountered this at the at the AFIP. So this is, as you can see, this is 10 years ago, and this patient already has a, a chest tube. They presented with a spontaneous pneumothorax, and I just saw a, a follow-up CT today on this patient. So they did do a surgical lung biopsy you know, shortly after this study. I don't, um, you know, to, to make a diagnosis. There's also this strange little, mostly soft tissue, a little bit, some areas that are a little bit lower attenuation that will still be there. Uh, but I'll show you the CT from today because it, it better shows the distribution of these cysts. Most of them are spherical. Some of them have you know, the, the perivascular findings. You know, this is a man or, or you know, genetically XY. Um, and there's no, that's staple line, there's no calcium or ossification in any of these cysts. Because we were, I was discussing this with my fellow today, I was wondering if this could be light chain deposition disease. You know, are they lower or are they diffuse? They're pretty diffuse. Can you show me on a coronal? Sure. sure. Yeah, no renal disease, no skin disease that we know of. And maybe a couple of them are more, yeah, are more yeah, pretty, uh, pretty even. Yeah. So, um, so the surgical pathology, and they were fairly definitive in this, and it looks like it was shown to a pathologist at Hopkins as well in 2012, was that this was consistent with multifocal cystic fibrohistiocytic tumor, which was a new one for me, and. They describe that they like metaplastic squamous epithelium within these. Within these, they don't mention whether they stain for amyloid or not. Hopefully, they would have. Uh, but this is a rare entity that's been described a handful of times. It's thought to be maybe low-grade malignancy, and they they always suggest like searching for a a fibrohistiocytic tumor of of the skin or other part of the body that metastasizes to the lungs. That little soft tissue thing in the right lower lobe is unchanged. Because when I saw that at first, I was thinking maybe that's like a little amyloidoma or, or whatnot, but I had never encountered this entity. And this you know, this is the one patient that gets scanned every year here and has carried this diagnosis for 10 years. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. So, so Chris, Chris Meyer is um, <clears throat> looking for examples of cystic lung disease. So. Jeff, can you uh, poke it at Chris and tell him that Travis has the case of the century? I will. Well, again, it depends on the path. You know, I was texting with, I was talking about this with Brett Elliker this morning. He sent me an, an article 
you know, where there were a couple of patients presumptively diagnosed with similar histiocytic disease of the lung, and then they and then they ended up having novel mutations in the folliculin gene and thought it was more of a Berthog Dubé type of thing. I mean, I don't. You know, these are fairly diffuse. Maybe a couple of them look a little lentiform along the fissures. Yeah, but... they, it doesn't look like Berthog Dubé, right? Because it's not. No, I agree. It and, doesn't look. And these have been remarkably unchanged for 12 years or 10 years now. So, hmm. That's... I mean, we'll go with it unless the pathologist in, at here and at Hopkins are both uh, smoking something. Oh. Cool guys. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah. All right. Uh, Howard, you want to go now? Yep. All right. Let me show you this one. Um, so let me give you a bit of background here. I was reading a bedside chest radiograph in a patient that. I uh, had a chest tube in and pleural fluid and a history of fractures. So I started looking at the at the history and saw that the patient had had some trauma fractures, had been admitted for, I think, two days, went home. A couple of days later, came back with left pleural fluid and they drained the fluid and got some blood. So I thought oh, that's a little interesting. So I started poking around and looked at the CT. So the first CT I looked was the closest one in proximity to the time-wise to the radiograph I was looking at. So I started looking and here's some pleural fluid. And the, the chest the CT the fluid was drained subsequently, but I started looking around. Here's a non-contrast CT, fractures fine. And then I said, oh, wait a minute. What's like here? And this wasn't described in the report of this exam. Here. Pleural fluid here. And then I'll show you the SAG alongside it. And here it is. So, oh, that sure looks like a hemidiaphragm injury and a defect. Yay big, with a little bit of fat herniating through the defect into the basal chest. So I'll leave that up and let's go back to the first CT from the outside hospital. So let me get my time right, nine and 23. And let's go back there and see if if we can see it. Got the fractures, but I cannot see it. Looking as hard as I as I could, I can't see that defect now. One could maybe imagine there's some thinning there, but absolutely can't see a defect. So my speculation is that there was a hemidiaphragm injury, a little tear, and then just with the passage of time, the tear broke down sufficient to create the hole and a bit of fat came up there. I don't know if there's a relationship between the pleural fluid that accumulated and the defect, because it's not very large. And if any of you guys see anything there to hint at it as I scroll around, but I absolutely don't see anything there. So I'm just calling that a kind of a delayed hernia. So they fixed that and also fixed the ribs and put a couple of plates, I think, on the ribs. Have you ever seen kind of a, a semi-delayed? I mean, it's kind of delayed, but not, not delayed in a lot of time, but there it is. It's real. I mean, I've seen cases of people with diaphragmatic hernias who had remote car crashes or something and presumably had been there, but they somehow developed symptoms. But I, like yours is more subacute, but. Yeah. Here's the time between those two, nine and 23. And I, and I remember learning in residency, like if you had a patient who was intubated, sometimes 
or especially if they had positive pressure ventilation, sometimes that can mask a diaphragmatic injury because of the elevated intrathoracic pressures. But yeah, it doesn't look like there was anything there before. No, no. So they fixed that, kind of interesting. Let me show you two cases that I have some annotated path images to show you. So first, this patient, imaging findings on radiography, yeah, reticulation or reticular nodular opacities, peripheral lungs, lung bases, of course, going to be much easier to perceive the nature and the extent of disease here. So definitely a lot of subpleural reticulation. Upper lung zones are involved. I don't think the interior of these lungs is normal. So it's not exclusively subpleural, but definitely predominantly subpleural. There is a greater degree of involvement of the lower lungs, for sure. Again, subpleural reticulation. The only place where I got just a little hint of maybe a focus of subpleural traction bronchiolectasis is there, but otherwise remarkably not. Otherwise findings of subpleural traction bronchiolectasis and no honeycombing that I can see. And definitely not a disease that's confined to just the subpleural lung regions. So this turned out to be something just unrelated up here that was removed. That was, I think, a cystic lesion that was subsequently removed. A benign lesion there. So certainly from the point of view of UIP, I would simply say indeterminate. Um, and because you're saying indeterminate of, versus probable? Um, Why do you I think indeterminate? I think that from my point of view, I don't think there is enough subpleural traction bronchiolectasis and basal predominant disease to use the description probable, I don't think. Would you say probable based on this right there? I fair? would just say for, from the distribution, the whole thing, I, I, <laughs> just the distribution, so strikingly subpleural. It's it is, worse. It is yeah. diffuse, but it's worse in the lower lobes. I mean, I, I would you know it's the patient looks like they're a smoker um yeah i, I would say probable for this i'm bothered by the the density of the central lung it's like that is cool. the lung I mean, is, unless there's something looks, there's some rb superimposed on it that's the only, aren't they are they a smoker i thought there was some emphysema not a smoker that i know of I mean, I'm seeing a lot of central lobby there, or at least ground glass more centrally in the lungs, and that bothers. I mean, I don't see normal lungs centrally. That's what in here, just in general. Yeah, it's just it's too big. Yeah. Maybe two things, but I mean, the, yeah, I've seen cases of that look like a UIP, but there's, and that's what the indeterminate category is for. I think is there's features that don't necessarily send you to another diagnosis, but it's not close enough that we're just going to say, oh, this is just UIP because. I don't know, those lungs, look, there's, I think there's too much ground glass, which technically makes it in, 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 you know, inconsistent. But I, I think there's enough, the fibrosis is so subpleural. And yeah. I like that component, but I don't like the central lung. I, I agree with Howard, but I mean, this is what, there's no clear criteria for indeterminate. It's very vague in the paper, but that's why, and at first when it came out, I didn't like it because I was like, well, if you're gonna give a classification system, you need to give definitions. But in reality, I like the indeterminate one. I use it a lot for our multidisciplinary because those are the kind of cases we get. Yeah. And and a lot of these end up being connective tissue disease with some UIP-like features. The other thing is I think that there's um, there's some mosaic attenuation going on in those, mm -hmm. particularly in that left lower lobe. So I'm glad to see the expiration. I don't know whether this pans out as air travel. Let me put that um, expiration images. Yeah, there's a focus here of a couple of obules maybe there not too much though let me give you another one and another one yeah let's let's see yeah. if the middle lobe and upper lobe are involved i think um i think there's there's yeah there's upper lobe 
on both sides and lower lobes. So you've got three lobes, and that was the criteria we used in some of the drug studies for saying that that's that's enough in the way of air trapping to to score it. So I would say that this is uh, not uh, IPF. Yeah, I don't know. They're, they're just a few areas of air trapping, but not too much, though. It's not a not a dominant finding at all. So do you have path on it? I do, yeah. So I'll bring that up. So let me just make this such that we can see it properly. That looks like UIP. <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. Um, you're going to see more. They're going to call it out. Okay. Um, here we have some NSIP like fibrosis described as focally. So here are some interlobular septa that are thickened, yes, with some fibrosis. But then this was a fairly dominant finding. So there were lots of granulomas. So it is HP. With giant cells. So here's a lot of interstitial granulomas, airway centric granulomas, giant cells within the granulomas. So yeah, under the microscope, this was described as consistent with fibrotic HP rather than UIP. There weren't any of the typical features of UIP on the That's OPAF. interesting to be called NSIP because usually that's not associated with fibrotic HP. So that's kind of interesting. I don't know that the um, fo the foci of of NSIP were dominant though. There were just some focal areas like that. But the overall the overall pattern is not that of UIP. And then the granulomas. So this was signed out as consistent, most consistent with the fibrotic HP. Oh, there you go. This other one is um, just a really nice example of one that we will not have trouble with, but it's really nice for trainees. So let me see if I've got the right one. Yeah, um, this is really nice for trainees. This is a really nice example of end stage pulmonary LCH. So we have a lot of cystic disease of course, the cysts here have become confluent and we just have large emphysema-like areas in the upper lobes and a lot of cystic disease in the lower lungs, but not as much, of course. Some relative sparing of the lung bases, but there is disease there. And I asked the pathologist to send me a couple of images from the explanted lungs just for my teaching file. So here we go for that. And no surprise that we're just going to see mostly cystic spaces. Let me show you. Nice image of smokers macrophages or pigment laden macrophages, fine pigment. And then these in between the cystic spaces, these scars that she described as stellate or medusa head appearance, very consistent with PLCH, of course. Here's a bigger image of one of the scars, very consistent with PLCH that you see, but otherwise really just large areas of lung that are mostly just cystic spaces, and then a few islands of tissue. Howard, did he comment about any of the, um, any vascular remodeling, since sometimes they get bad, they can get pulmonary hypertension? Mm -hmm. No, not in the path slides that okay. I got. That. That's nice that you got those images. That so like nice. your stellate lesion. Yeah, a really nice case. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let me see if I have one other interesting one. Um, Showed you that one. 
Oh yeah, here's a nice case. So here's a trauma patient reading uh, bedside radiography in the morning, see the usual things, patient's still intubated, got a cervical collar, got a right chest tube, got rib fractures, got a scapular fracture, kind of the usual things we see. And then the next day, kind of the same. And then, oh, here's something interesting. So we have like on day three or so, findings of right upper lobe atelectasis, elevated minor fissure, and then right here, right next to that upper lobe, but localized to just here, even with the chest tube in, is a small pneumothorax. So I describe this as consistent with pneumothorax, sorry about that, ex vacuo. Now, of course, I can't prove that, but you know, this pneumothorax localized to just here really appeared at the time this became atelectatic. So I'm thinking that this may be a nice example of pneumothorax ex vacuo. For those of you that are interested in the original article, this is it going back to 1996, is that what it is? Pneumothorax ex vacuo right there. But I think that's a likely explanation. For, for that. So Howard, is the theory that this is actually extrapleural gas? No, intrapleural gas and maybe thought to be nitrogen. So coincident with the right upper lobe volume loss, you get the gas appearing in, in that location. And I think the, the examples they showed in 1996 in this article, the pneumothorax was often located in direct proximity to the, the atelectatic lobe. I think they had one or two or maybe three involving the right upper lobe with the pneumothorax right there. So okay. kind of like this one. What accounts for the for that the, that localization of the pneumothorax? I guess the idea is that um, the lung wants to fall away, it's atelectatic and there's a, a change in the pleural pressure such that gas is drawn into that portion of the pleural space is the the general reasoning. Okay. Like this. The gas being from the adjacent tissues, maybe in nitrogen I've always assumed. And the idea being that you you don't have to put a tube in there. It'll just go away spontaneously. Okay, those are my cases, Jeff. All right, thank you. Um, David. I have one diaphragm case. So I hope people can see uh, a pair of radiographs. This is a, yep. a 28 radiograph on your right here before this person uh, had difficulty. So back in 2018, we have normal height of both hemidiaphragms. And then the person had episode of severe um, neck and shoulder pain on the left that sort of came, I think, after a respiratory infection. Uh, didn't have any trauma, didn't visit a chiropractor or anything like that. And found herself short of breath, 53 years old and now has this elevation of the left hemidiaphragm. And on lateral view, we can see that it's kind of a steep elevation uh, with a return to near normal height posteriorly, which is a very good shape for eventration. It's not an expected shape for uh, paralysis. So with pa paralysis, the, the arc tends to be shallow, not steep like this. And the elevation is maintained all the way to the posterior chest wall. So this shape of elevation goes with eventration, um, not particularly with um, paralysis. So uh, there was a CT scan around this time. This is after, after this, uh, this had begun. So this is not, we don't have a pre-episode CT to show you, but um, I can show you that that earliest CT that we have, which is from January of 2020, and you can see that 
I think this is probably the MIP and not the world's best image here. Yeah, that's a MIP. Let me give you the standard. Okay, so let's look for cruise thickness on that side. And we can see that the cruise is a little bit thin. So compared to the right. So normally the left cruise is thinner than the right. And if we look at um, anterior muscle, um, you know, we have respectable muscle thickness anteriorly for that left hemidiaphragm. So maybe a modest degree of thinning here, but not, not really that striking. Probably if the person were not symptomatic, you probably just not really respond to that degree of thinning. And then this is a subsequent CT about 10 months later. And um, I think that the thinning may have progressed a little bit. So that cruise is a little bit thin. And let's look at anterior, anterior diaphragm, which is easiest to see on coronal um, coming up here. Here's coronal for this in this era. And you can see very normal thickness here of right hemidiaphragm anteriorly and some thinning here anteriorly on the left. So, um, and then let me show you the results of the sniff test. So I'll just show you the frontal view, but we have vigorous excursion of the right hemidiaphragm on deep inspiration. And we have very little response of the dome with the left hemidiaphragm on deep inspiration compared to the right. And then on sniffing, you're, you can see that the left hemidiaphragm jerks upward on a sniff. And um, I can't show you the lateral now because I, I have to rearrange the images so that they would display and not uh, sit in the middle here of these right images, the interleave with them. So I can't show you the lateral. So this syndrome is Parsonage-Turner syndrome, which is a uh, a, a, some sort of neuropathy, and people think it's an autoimmune thing. It often comes after a respiratory infection or something like that. It may be part of an autoimmune um, response that's triggered by a previous viral infection. It usually comes after. And um, it's, a, it's a painful neuropathy when people will have neck, shoulder, and arm pain. And then they notice that they're short of breath after after that, and they have paralysis. About 50% of cases are better in a year. I have seen some cases that one of our radiologists had this syndrome, and he got better in a year, um, and the, his left hemidiaphragm elevation resolved and went back to normal height. So most people get better, but not all. Some people are left with a permanent, permanent problem. And this person is, uh, I think, up more than a year out and still has still has this problem. So this may not be going away in her. So it's Parsonage-Turner. It's some sort of probably autoimmune neuropathy that is triggered by maybe a respiratory infection. It can occur in other situations. People who are have had transplants and things like that can get it. Um, it would be interesting to know whether it's the virus attacking the nerve directly as in with COVID or whether it's an autoimmune response to COVID because I have seen at least one case of this after COVID. Um, and it, it developed fairly fairly soon after symptoms, I think in, in that person. So I would attribute that probably to the uh, neuropathy caused directly by the virus rather than an autoimmune response to it just because of the proximity of the finding to the onset of symptoms. But Parsonage-Turner is this painful, usually preceded by sh shoulder arm pain, and then uh, a neuropathy that involves phrenic nerve. And brachial plexus as well sometimes. That's right. And that, the, the pain is coming from the brachial plexus and yeah. in, in that region are the, um, you know, the branches of the phrenic nerve. Good point. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you'd seen a case with COVID because when you said it was post-viral or whatever. Yeah, if, I've seen a, a case of COVID. I showed it um, a few months ago, mm -hmm. and um, that person um, that those that was the person whose symptoms really began at the time of the infection within a few days, and so I think that that was probably direct involvement. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. You know, I think. It's probably a vascular injury to the nerve. That's that's my theory because 
there's all this small vessel um, arteriopathy that goes with COVID. I think it's probably the nerve supply, it's the vascular supply to the nerve that knocks it out. I just okay, saw guys, that's a, all I had this week. I just saw a um, case report in radiology from August of last year, Parsons Turner syndrome following COVID-19 vaccination, MR neurography. Hmm. Good. Yeah, that that is a very good autoimmune sort of situation, isn't it? Yeah, it, maybe it's both. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, David. That that's a cool case. All righty. Uh, I can show a few here before we wrap up. Let's see. Application. All righty, so, um, so this is a case of a young person who had a upper, a hand sarcoma that was treated with surgery and radiation, and this was a surveillance CT, and um, what was interesting, I'll make it a little bigger here, are there's some holes in the lung, there's a cyst here, as you scroll down, little bitty ones scattered throughout, um, Enough to yeah, we're not seeing your we're not seeing your data we're seeing your database we know at the moment. Okay. Um had uh, this problem in a, had this problem in a long time. Okay, let me stop sharing and then let me reshare the screen. Um, how about now? Good. Yeah, I don't know, it did that. It must have tried to do a different application. Okay, anyway, um, young person with uh, hand sarcoma, you can see little cysts throughout. And um, I didn't dig, at first I didn't look into it as much um, because you know there are the epithelial sarcomas that can occur on the fingers. And if, uh, there are case reports of cystic mets from these, but I went back, these cysts had been here for a long time. So then I had to figure out some other things. And as I was continuing to look at the case, I noticed along the chest wall, there's all of these little nodules here. If you look on the soft tissue window, um, you can see they're associated with the skin and, and just below it. So this patient also has neurofibromatosis type one, and the sarcoma in the hand was a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. So um, since these cysts have been there for as far back as I could go, which was, was several years, I suspect these are NF1 related cysts, which has been described. Um, doesn't have any better explanation for them. And I haven't seen them very often, so I don't know much about them other than um, they're probably random and small. And I don't know if they're related to neurofibromas in the lung obstructing something that we just don't see. That would be my guess, but have any of you seen cysts with NF1? Yeah, the one or two cases I've seen have been much more florid and easier to see than these, which are quite sparse. Mm -hmm. And the ones I've seen, I think they're mostly in the subpleural lungs, I think. Okay. The ones I've seen look this, they're just a few scattered. Oh, just a few, huh? Yeah. And see, here's well, the, the, I mean, I've only seen, I think I have one or two cases. Yeah. I mean, not a huge number, but they're small. So, yeah, I thought that was kind of cool, though. Um, and this one's nice because you can see the, you can see the, the, the neurofibromas. Okay. Um, I've got two examples of a, of a nice, finding that Howard first made me aware of. Um, and these are two different cases of patients with lung edema. You can see there's septal lines. Uh, this patient was immediately post-op of having a, a, a deep brain stimulator placed and was a little short of breath. Um, so they were concerned about PE. Um, they actually, um, the, they gave the patient some extra fluid because of hypotension in the OR. Um, but you'll see there's this layering let me make it bigger but there's this layering gradient of ground glass opacity and if we come and look in certain areas it kind of has this kind of like these little peaks um in a few of the yeah, down the right. yeah. yes so the so-called uh, um uh, lo uh, lobular gradient of it or the karst mountain uh, appearance um that howard first showed us and i think it was in the context of re-expansion edema uh, other than that, I think, I think it, it was, um, yeah, you can see like layering yeah, in the spot. And then I had another one, yeah. Yeah, you can see these little gradients here in these lobules. Um, here is the, yeah. uh, let me get the right article. Here's the article I think that you can mm -hmm. Yeah, this one's obviously a prettier example there. And then this is it from the uh, 
the Chinese landscape paintings of these mountains. Um, so this that's is a really good example you have. Thanks. Yeah, I thought this was a, a decent one because uh, um, what's kind of cool is I had another one this this week as well. Um, exact same thing, a different patient, um, not post-op, but also another edema, uh, non non re-expansion. You can see there's a fusion, but look at these. These are also quite nice in here. So uh, ever since you guys have shown this sign, uh, I've, I've probably walked by it. In the, with this, the other case had the septal lines, made it a little easier, but I've probably walked by it a few times and um, realized that it was, um, you know, just called it, you know, if it was dependent on electasis or not. But I think in this case, I was pretty confident this was, was probably edema with that gradient. So that was kind of fun to see two of those. Um, this is another nice case. This is a 40-some-odd-year-old uh, man who's a former smoker who presented back in, oh, I don't know, he presented a while ago, back in the fall or something um, with cough, dry cough. And you can see he's got nice hyalur enlargement and one of the better examples of donut-type sign, although I've never found one that actually looked like a donut, but clearly has nice hyalur lymphadenopathy and um, not, not so convincing me, but he does have a nice uh, subaortic node there. And then so he underwent a CT scan at the time, um, which confirms the lymphadenopathy. Um, so nice symmetric lymphadenopathy. So pretty good for sarcoid in a patient of this age. What's interesting about this case is if I show you the upper lungs, there's a few little nodules, but not a ton. But as we go down, you'll see that there are some nice clusters of perilymphatic nodules in the basis. Hmm. And there's a, some septal thickening, and um, but it's predominantly perilymphatic nodules. If you look very carefully, this is all kind of clustered nodules along the, the lymphatics here. Um, I think this was, I don't remember where this was read, but it was called, I think, septal thickening. Um, so sarcoid was considered, but a, a sort of a, a diagnosis of a differential was given. The patient was supposed to see pulmonary, never did, but he managed to come back for another scan. And what's changed, the lymph nodes got a little bit better, but the, the this is, it's regressing on its own. He's not received any treatment, but uh, on this scan, you can see the nodules a lot better because the, the, the septal component has sort of disappeared. But this is sort of what I called an upside down sarcoid. Um, but I think it has all the features of it. Um, he's the right, right demographic and he has the lymphadenopathy and, you know, isn't and it's getting better on its own. So this is a one you'd presume just let go into remission on its own. But I've seen a handful now of some I mean if you collect enough sarcoid cases, you see some weird ones, but I've only seen a few that were just in the lower lobes. And it's so classically upper lobe or even just um you know mid upper lobe. I've not seen one that's so exquisitely lower lobe. Right. You should go back to smoking because smoking will suppress sarcoidosis. Well, I know it, if you smoke, you're less likely to get it, but I don't, I, I can't confirm that if you, if you, if you have sarcoid and you start smoking, that it goes away. <laughs> but yeah, there they are, little nodules. All right, and then um, my last case is another interesting case. This patient is a 38-year-old who carries um, a diagnosis of asthma and has these recurrent urticaria, and was having some respiratory symptoms and other than asthma. And you can see uh, even early on, there is some subtle mosaic attenuation. And then there's these little patches of ground glass opacity um, that very lobular looking and thick airway walls. Mm -hmm. And um, again, just a few of these little ground glass areas. So, uh, I mean, could it be COVID? Sure, but the, the prevalence of COVID has dropped dramatically in many places. Um, with that diagnosis, though, I would think about eosinophilic lung disease, uh, including G EGPA, just simple eosinophilia. Um, and then there's this entity of eosinophilic bronchitis, which I guess you could have eosinophilic anything because there's this whole eosinophilic esophagitis. Uh, but um, with the asthma, and the patient did have peripheral eosinophilia, I suspect this is an eosinophilic pneumonia, uh, if you want to call it that, uh, with probably some chronic uh, airway remodeling or inflammation related to eosinophilia. And I had another case to today of the same thing. A patient had peripheral eosinophils of 16, was an asthmatic, and had this new patchy ground glass that looks all the world like COVID or organizing pneumonia, but 
you know, doesn't have a fever, doesn't have um, rest, uh, more chronic, I mean, more acute respiratory symptoms. And the, with COVID and flu testing, it's pretty easy to get those as negative. But um, I, yeah. I mean, I've seen cases that look like this that meet uh, clinical criteria for ABPA. Like they have the positive IgE, they have the peripheral eosinophilia, they have the hypersensitivity to aspergillus antigen. Have but, they done all that stuff? Well, the, one of them was in the emergency department. The other one was an outpatient clinic, but with no with no mucus plugs, no, no bronchi. Yeah, yeah. No, no uh, mucus plugging and no bronchiectasis. Yeah. I have a couple of cases that are. And I've seen, um, I have cases of ABPA with eosinophilic pneumonia, like new ground glass in the areas of you know, plugs and stuff. But, yeah. Yeah, not, not these areas. Of, let, me, let me back up. These areas are ground glass, but I have other people who are in like this eosinophilic bronchitis kind mm -hmm. of thing. I have, you know, people that have, you know, what look like just bad asthma on CT, and by clinical definition, they have raging ABPA, mm -hmm. like all their, because you can have ABPA without bronchiectasis. Right, especially if it's more early on in the disease. Yeah. Yeah, and I wonder if the ABPA causes an eosinophilic pneumonia. Yes. Yes, it does. I have I have cases of that. So I'm Seth. I'm glad you said that because I was about to I was about to say it too. So you know I think a lot of the um, these, these people probably do. I'll bet you his persistence are going to be positive. Okay. Yeah. I forgot to show the sinuses too. <laughs> yeah, looks painful. All kind of fit. No, I just, the urticaria I mean, I, is interesting though. How you tie that in there? I guess you know mast cell issues, but. Um, I was just saying, like, I remember I got, you know, got a big lecture from one of our senior pulmonologists at uh, Maryland when, you know, the patient, the history was ABPA, and I read the thing, it was just looking like bad asthma, and I said, you know, no evidence of ABPA, and he came down, he's like, let me tell you, let, let's have a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and he went over the whole cl clinical, you know, what, what the diagnosis is, and that imaging is, you don't need positive imaging to make the diagnosis and all this stuff, so. I'm like, oh, really? And anyways. Well, that's good. Well, thanks for that's that's educational. Thank you so much. All right, guys. Well, it's the hour and great cases this week. And, um, I will talk to you all next week. Thanks, all right. everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.